Father, thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for this day. These days go by so rapidly. It, it, it's something we comment on from time to time. Uh, when we were kids, life went by so slowly. The older we get, the faster it goes by. Seems like every year brings an accelerated pace. Um, it's flying by. And uh, even as we live each day, we have things that worry us, that deeply concern us. We, we look out ahead, and we're supposed to do that because we're men. We are providers. We are the men of provision. And a man with vision, and that, then that prefix pro, it, it really means to have vision before it comes. So there is a fine line between appropriately thinking about the future and thinking about our responsibilities in the future and thinking about what the future will look like and we try to anticipate the future, but there's a fine line between thinking about it and obsessing over it. There's a fine line be between pondering it and considering it and worrying ourselves sick over it. We're living in times in this nation of great instability. We are living in times in this nation where we take what is good and we call it bad. And we take what is bad and we call that good. We are in complete confusion. We are upside down when it comes to you and your truth and your commandments. And it has brought about terrible consequences and great pain and great misery to countless people. And as we look ahead, we don't see it turning around anytime soon. And as men, this can weigh on us, it can worry us, it can gnaw at us, it can cause us to lose our peace and our joy This is where we have to come back to what is true. This is where we have to come back to the facts. We thank you for the facts of Christianity. We thank you for the logic of Christianity. We thank you for the truth. And you ask us, Lord, and you call us to engage our minds and to control our emotions by thinking about what is true. So, this day, some of us, when we woke up, we went to bed worried and we woke up worried. But today, Lord, somehow you've gotten us through this day. You've been good, you've been gracious, you've provided, you've made a way. Uh, we'll study your word tonight, we'll go home, we'll go back to bed, we'll get up and we'll do it all over again. We thank you that the scriptures tell us that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you that you don't want us living in fear. Isaiah 41, fear not, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will help you, I will strengthen you, I will uphold you with my mighty right hand. We want to live off the facts, Lord. As everything continues to crumble, May our lives and may our families and our homes be places of stability because we are built on the rock of Jesus Christ and his word. If we're following you, we're out of step with everything that's around us. But help us, Lord, to not look back, to put our hand to the plow and to keep following you and plowing those furrows straight 
and paths of righteousness. May we not look to the left or to the right, but may we fix our eyes on Jesus. Uh, life is going by, and we're like a bullet train headed into things that frighten us. But we don't fear. As the old song says, we don't know the future, but we know who holds the future. We trust you, and we thank you that our eternal future is set and secure in Christ. And if that's set, you'll take care of every day in between and make a way for us. It's with that hope we pray in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this semester we're working our way through, kind of uh, haven't done this before, but I, I did a book back in 1990 called Point Man, and if you've been here, um, you've heard me say a couple of weeks now for, this is what, our fourth week together? I, I'm, I'm working through the concept of, of Point Man because it's Spiritual Leadership 101. Uh, it's how a man, I, the subtitle was How a Man Can Lead a Family. Uh, when when we come to Christ, everything changes in our lives. Uh, old things pass away, the scripture says, all things become new. And there's a radical heart change, a radical heart change that occurs. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Uh, before we know Christ, we're spiritually blind. Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they may not see the truth of the gospel. Before we know Christ, we truly can't see the gospel. We can hear it, but we can't absorb it. Um, not only are, are, we, are, we, are our eyes blind, you know, when Paul was on the road to Damascus and he encountered the Lord Jesus and that, um, that, that world-changing call was put on his life, um, that was, a, that was a remarkable thing because one of the things that happened to him is when he became blind and at a certain point when he was prayed for, the scales fell off of his eyes. Now that's what happens to us when we come to know Christ. Uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 2. It says that a natural man cannot discern or understand the things of God because the things of God are spiritually appraised. So when we come to Christ, we're born again. There's a new heart. There's a new mind. And we start seeing things differently than we'd ever seen them before. When, when we come to Christ, we're born again. Uh, we've got two grandkids on the way. My daughter Rachel is going to have a baby in the summer, and my uh, daughter-in-law Christina is going to have a baby next month. So John and Christina were at the house yesterday, and we were talking, and the whole conversation was about the baby who's coming, the little boy who's coming next month. We're just talking about the little guy who's coming. We're talking about the birth, the birth, the birth, the birth. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When that little guy shows up, we're not talking about birth anymore. Because once the birth occurs, there's no more discussion about birth because the birth has occurred. From here on out, the discussion will be about growth, about development. Well, how's he doing here? How's he doing here? See, that's the way it is in Christian life. You have someone that you know, and they desperately need to know the Lord, and you pray, and you're asking the Lord to work in their heart. And then there are times it looks like nothing's ever going to happen and nothing's going to change. And then Christ moves in their heart, pulls them, they come to know the Lord, and they're born again. Well, from here on out, your prayers aren't about birth, but your whole conversation and your prayers revolve around growth and maturity. So when we come to the Lord, he takes us from, uh, from being dead in our trespasses and sins. He makes us alive in Christ. When we trust in Christ alone, for our salvation instead of our works or anything else we'd bring to the table. And now we're born again, and now we're on the press process of growing. And things that we had no interest in prior to that, suddenly we have an interest in. And one of the things that happens to men, if, you have a, if you're a husband, if you're a father, uh, you suddenly begin to have a different take on your family, and you understand, and you'll pick up some language from someone at church, or you'll hear a message that you have a responsibility to lead that family spiritually, and you never thought about this before in your life. This is why I did Point Man. Point Man was a book that I wrote on how to be a spiritual leader for guys who didn't know how to be spiritual leaders. And we've said this in here many times. 
If your father wasn't a spiritual leader, how would you know how to be a spiritual leader? It would be if someone, if, if some, uh, a couple of officials from the U.S. cricket team came in here and said, hey, listen, uh, we had some cricket matches in McKinney and the whole team got sick with the flu. We need 20 guys who can take a week and go to England and suit up. All expenses paid. Well, shoot, I'm, I'm clear this week. Yeah, I may. I wouldn't mind going to England. Yeah, put you up in, you know, nice hotel over there. Now, now uh, I'm willing to go. You want to pay my expenses? Here's my problem. I've never seen cricket in my life. But you want to pay my way, I'll go. Uh, they wear pads in cricket. Uh, how do you put them on? Uh, they got something like a bat, only it's flat. So you hit the ball. Do you run left or do you run right? You go, you run right. Now, that's baseball. How do you know you run right? You've never seen cricket. How do you know? If you've never seen it, how would you know how to do it? If you've never seen spiritual leadership, how would you know how to be a spiritual leader? Yeah, you say, yeah, my dad didn't show me how to be a spiritual leader. You can't be too hard on your father because his father never showed him how to be a spiritual leader and his father never showed him. This goes on up through the generations. Now, I wrote Point Man because through the grace of God, my dad was a spiritual leader. I grew up with it. I saw it. And when I wrote the book, I said, my dad's the real author of the book. I just watched him and I wrote it down. He watched his father, and he wrote down what he said, or he didn't write it down, he passed it on to me, but he learned it from his dad. Now, it's interesting, my grandfather, he had to figure it out, because his father wasn't a spiritual leader. So in every family, it has to start somewhere. And the idea of Point Man was, you want to have a biblical family? You want to have a marriage that lasts? You want to be connected with your kid? You're in a battle. And the guy who is... Uh, Appointed, oftentimes, to lead a small patrol, he's called the guy on point. He's the point man. You're a husband, you're a father, you're the guy on point. And now you've got an enemy, and he wants to take you out, and he wants to neutralize you and keep you from leading. We're living in interesting times. Um, interesting is one word. Tragic is another. Sad is another. Uh, grievous is another. Uh, I, I think many of us uh, have, have genuine grief over what we see happening in this country. Uh, is it uh, Psalm 11, 3, that says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We're watching it being dismantled. We're watching the pillars, we're watching the foundations being destroyed pretty much on a daily basis. Another one goes down. It's disheartening. It's discouraging. Uh, and we inevitably think about our kids and we think about our grandkids and where all of this is headed. Um, we were built on certain principles. We were built on certain foundations. If you ever take a trip to Washington, D.C., you will see proof of the foundations because you see scripture everywhere in Washington, D.C. Everywhere. If you go into the Capitol Rotunda, they have these massive paintings that were done, massive. One of them is of the pilgrims holding up the Bible over their heads. It's, it's a remarkable painting uh, that had a lot of symbolism. They weren't standing over the Bible because they weren't above the Bible. The Bible was over them because they were under it, and it is the book of books it is the Holy Bible, it is the Word of God, and they're under its authority. It is the Word of God. Laws come from somewhere. Every law comes from somewhere. Oh, you're just trying to legislate your morality. Every law is legislating somebody's morality. Sharia law is legislating somebody's morality. Lawlessness, the, the ignoring of laws on the books, is lawlessness, and it's the spirit of the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist is called the man of lawlessness. You see, Jesus came and fulfilled the law in every point. He didn't ignore it. He fulfilled it on our behalf because we were not able to fulfill the law. You see, 
What the law does is show us our sin. So Christ came, crossed every T, dotted every I, fulfilled the law in every point, went to the cross for you and for me, paid the penalty that we owed, redeemed us, transferred us into, through adoption, Romans 8, into the family of God, made it possible for us to be in relationship with God the Father. It's a remarkable thing. Um, if you read any of uh, Peter Marshall Jr.'s works on American history, and you read the true story of the pilgrims, you read the biblical basis, uh, th these laws, these monuments in D.C., they've got scripture all over the place. At the Supreme Court, they've got the Ten Commandments, chiseled in marble. But you see, that was how many years ago? How many years ago was this country founded? If you study the rise and fall of great nations, you find that they tend, uh, if you look at great civilizations, pretty much the, on the outstretch, maybe, maybe they'll last 250 years. Well, you do the math. We, we shouldn't be surprised where we are. Now, on this positive note, aren't you glad that you came tonight? Uh, nations come and go, but uh, Christ is always doing his work, you see, and he has a plan for the ages. History is his story. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. He has a plan for this nation. He raises up rulers. He sets them down. He raises up nations. He sets them down. Uh, he's at work. And oftentimes, I'll hear guys say, man, I'm afraid, I'm so, I'm so discouraged with what I'm seeing, I'm afraid we're going to lose the whole thing. Daniel lost the whole thing. The whole thing. His nation was taken into captivity. They lost the nation, they lost their free enterprise system, they lost their land, they were taken into captivity for 70 years. Nobody went, man, I can't even think about that. Well, you ought to think about it. As Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say, think about the worst. Go ahead and think about it. Go ahead and think about the worst. Well, I'm hoping it never happens. Yeah, but what if it does happen? See, the psychologists say, well, don't worry about it because it probably won't happen. See, that's kind of screwy. Go ahead and think about it because it might happen. Just go ahead and think about it. And if the worst were to happen as it happened to Daniel, as Lloyd-Jones said, if the worst were to happen, the very worst that you can imagine if it were to happen, he'd still be God, he'd still be your savior, he died on your behalf, he'll give us all things, he has a plan, he has a future, and you have hope, even if the worst happens, because he's God Almighty and he's sovereign over your life and he runs the world. Now that's, that's, that's the fact. So Daniel lost everything, the nation was in captivity for 70 years, and again, I repeat myself, but it's good to, I, I was speaking in a church in, in College Station last month, and as I'm walking around the parking lot into the um, auditorium in tile out front, they had uh, this passage from Jeremiah 29 that says, uh, we all know the passage, I know the, plans for uh, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. They got it out there in tile, great verse. And as I was teaching, at one point I said, hey, I saw that verse out there. Great verse. I said, you know who that was written to? The guys who lost everything. Read Jeremiah 29. It's written to the people that lost their nation, lost their land, lost their free enterprise system. The worst happened to them, and God says, yeah, I know the worst has happened, but I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And then in Jeremiah 29, as they're going into captivity for 70 years, he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get married. I want you to marry off your kids. I want you to build houses. I want you to plant crops. I want you to live life, even though life as you've known it has utterly and completely changed, but my hand is all over you. So we don't fear. We don't fear. We just keep our eyes on Christ. We keep going about our responsibilities and following him 
no matter what happens around us. We've had unbridled prosperity in this nation. It's getting more and more difficult. I would say this to you. As it gets more and more difficult, God is at work. Because, you know, there is, um, I think the more difficult life becomes, the more appealing the gospel becomes. The further that men get away from God, the more the good news of Christ makes sense. You see? Um, If you think about where we are as a country, you have to go back to the 60s. And in the 60s, uh, there was a massive earthquake that hit this country culturally and spiritually and morally. Um, well, usually when you have an earthquake, you have aftershocks afterwards. The aftershocks diminish in intensity. But this earthquake that hit our country in the 60s, that brought with it all kinds of things, like the sexual revolution and question authority, and all of these things, when the foundations really were hit and struck, we continue to have aftershocks. Here's what's interesting. But the aftershocks are not weaker. They keep getting stronger, and they're still with us. And this is why the foundations keep going down. It all goes back to what happened in the 60s. It, there, was a, there, there, there was a monumental, cataclysmic destruction. And it's still with us. Uh, So why are we doing this point man study? Because 25 years ago when I wrote this, there was a need, there was a tremendous need for men to step up and be spiritual leaders. I think the need is even greater today because things have gotten worse and worse. Um, A lot of times as men, You know what we're looking for in our lives as men? We're looking for meaning. Meaning. And, and when we don't see meaning in our lives, we don't do well. We need to see that who we are and what, are and what we're about, we need to see that our lives are productive and we need to see that our lives are significant. And see, a lot of times we don't feel that what we're doing is significant. But what I want to say to you is, if you're a man who is following Christ, if you're a man who is serious about growing in Christ and influencing those in your sphere that God has put around you, your wife, your kids, grandkids if you have them, if you're serious about that, I want to say to you, you're significant and you're a player. And you're doing a great work. It may not be a work that gets you on television or they write a book about you, but it's a great work. Because Francis Schaeffer used to say, there are no little people and there are no little places. You see. Last week, we uh, talked about two of the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, we read the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments are a big deal. They kind of summarize the moral foundation of the law of the Old Testament. And our country was pretty much based on it. Judeo-Christian, uh, the Judeo-Christian culture, Western civilization, was based on the Ten Commandments. Uh, Mozart was financed for a, a number of years by one of the princes of Austria. And uh, this prince, who gave Mozart a lot of money to write his music, listened to a... Uh, a piece that Mozart had done, and then he criticized Mozart because he said, uh, I think that this work you've done contains too many notes. And the emperor then said, I think you should cut some of the notes. And then Mozart looked at him and said, and my dear sir, what notes did you have in mind? Oh, he he was clueless. Uh, Starting in the 60s, I think a lot of people in our nation, and even more so today, felt that the Ten Commandments, there were too many commandments. And some needed to be cut. And in our culture, if you would ask, well, what needs to be cut? I think they'd tell you what they think needs to be cut. And the first one would be the Seventh Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. 
Because what happened in the 60s? There was a sexual revolution. And I mean, it changed everything. Uh, one of the things that's, uh, that has changed is when we talk about these issues of family and about being husbands and fathers, um, I mean, you don't need statistics to know the family is falling apart. It's fragmenting. Uh, we looked last week at, or a couple weeks ago in Save the Boys, what happens uh, when fathers are taken out of the home. And this was happening, it's been happening in the black community for a long, long time. But the white community is rapidly catching up. See, the enemy always wants to take fathers out of their role. The enemy always wants to take fathers out of positions of stability and of influence. And where were we 25 years ago? Well, no matter if, if you're family is black or white or whatever the skin color, whatever the race, families are going down. Uh, marriage is going down. Uh, back in, and I always get this, I always have difficulty with this. Back before the sexual revolution, see when the sexual revolution started, then it began to influence laws. It used to be that you couldn't get a divorce unless your spouse granted you a divorce. But then somebody really smart and brilliant came up with an idea of no-fault divorce. And it's devastated this country, and it devastates families. So it is possible, and I always get this wrong, it's easier to fire an employee. See, I got it wrong. It used to be. It used to be easier to fire an employee than it was to divorce a spouse. Correct? In fact, our country felt that marriage was so important and so sacred, and we understood that sometimes people would get frustrated and make unwise choices and want to go down paths that weren't good for them or for anyone else. So we, we made laws to keep them from doing something stupid. So you couldn't get a divorce if you just wanted a divorce. If your sp you couldn't get it unless your spouse signed off on it. And that kept a lot of divorce from happening. But suddenly that was bulldozed out of the way, and everything flip-flopped, and suddenly it was easier to divorce your wife than it is to fire an employee with a stroke of a pen. But I'm going to tell you something. Following Christ is always the best route. Um, if, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I'll tell you what the righteous can do. You can follow Christ. You don't have to go that way. You don't have to be influenced by that. We stay the course. We fix our eyes on Jesus. I thought it was interesting if you saw... Um, the Super Bowl this week, I thought it was interesting that Joe Namath was back at the Super Bowl. And he had on his, uh, he had his coat on. And, uh, you know, guys our age, they remember Namath, he was always doing stuff like that. Uh, I think a case could be made way back. Those of, there, are, there are those of us who remember when Namath won that Super Bowl, and he predicted that they would beat the Colts, and nobody thought they had a shot, and they did it. Probably the two premier quarterbacks of that era were uh, Joe Namath and Roger Staubach. And it used to be back then that the NFL pretty much was on uh, CBS. And Brent Musburger had the pregame show. Of course, Brent Musburger is still around. He's 183 years old now. Uh, Musburger's been around a long time. Um, you know, he started as a sports writer. Did you know that? He wasn't a broadcaster. He was a sports writer in the Chicago paper. But... Uh, they had this pregame show, and it was uh, Jimmy the Greek, Brent Musburger, Irv Cross, and Phyllis George. And some of you remember, she did an interview with Roger Staubach. And everybody was talking about Namath, and he was living the big life in New York City. And, and in the interview with Staubach, she said to him, she said, you know, you're often compared to Joe Namath. You guys are very successful. Uh, quarterbacks, and you've just had tremendous careers. But there's some differences between you and Joe, and Joe's known for the nightlife, and every time you see him, he's got a different woman in his arm, and 
he likes to live that, uh, that fast life and that loose life. And um, So Roger, what's your view on sex compared to Joe's? Just out of the blue, it was kind of shocking actually. And you know, he, uh, Staubach was always kind of unflappable. So what's your view on sex versus Joe Namath? And basically Staubach says, well, I think I enjoy sex just as much as Joe does. The only difference is I have all my sex with one woman. That was great. That was tremendous. He nailed it. Um, turn with me to First Timothy chapter three. Um, there is a phrase in First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy three is. In the early verses, in, in his letter, Paul is giving a description. Timothy uh, was given the responsibility to kind of set things up in this church and to get things organized, and they needed leaders. And so Paul wrote to him and said, I want you to appoint some leaders, some elders in the church. And here's a list of things that I want you to look for in the lives of the men that you will appoint to be leaders in the church. Uh, he doesn't say anything about their um, net worth. He doesn't say anything about their academic degrees. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, elder, it is a fine work that he desires to do. Uh, an overseer, an elder then, and now he's going to give the things that Timothy should look for. Okay? An overseer then must be above reproach. That has to do with character. Does it not? Yes, it does. All of these characteristics that Paul told Timothy to be on the lookout for, they're all about character. They're all about what a man is internally. Okay? By the way, they're all in the present tense. Uh, because, you see, men don't naturally... Um, well, you have to grow into these traits. They don't come naturally. Why? Because before we know Christ, they're certainly not in our lives. Once we come to Christ, we're immature. We have to become mature. So it takes a while. It takes seasoning. It takes time for these things to develop in our lives. So he says, overseers in must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine. No, no, hold on here. Well, I used to be an alcoholic. Okay, well, fine. Where are you now? Well, I'm just trusting the Lord every day to help me. Okay, great. And I've been clean X amount of time. Great. Well, then you're not addicted to wine. You used to be. See, these are present tense. These are present tense. Uh, these are men who have been redeemed. These are men who have grown up in Christ. These aren't men who have grown old in Christ. They've grown up. They're growing. They're developing. They're teachable. They're, they're seeing a change in their, in their hearts and in their behavior. Not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. Shoot, how many guys love money before we come to know Christ? How many of us love money after we come to know Christ? And then he's got to, you know, our hands are gripping everything we've got, and he's got to unpeel our hands off the stuff so that we don't love stuff. We love him. And, we, and most of us have got to learn some really hard lessons in those, in, in those areas, to not love money, but to love him. You don't get that overnight. You don't jump in a Christian microwave and hit love of money two and a half minutes. Hey, I don't love money. That, that's a torturous process, you see. Okay. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children in control with all dignity. But if a man doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Man, for many years, I didn't do that. I wasn't managing. I was just my business, and it was me, and I was self-centered. Man, I just completely ignored my, forget about managing. I just left everything in my wife. See, that's how it used to be. But what happened? The Lord got a hold of me, and there have been some changes, and see, I've gotten intentional, and see, see, that's how you used to be. That's why these are in the present tense. We can grow. We can develop. We can mature. I want to pick one because it, it, it makes the point I want to make tonight. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. 
the husband of one wife. Now, different churches have different viewpoints on whether a man with a divorce in his background can be appointed to leadership in the church. Now, that's not my issue tonight. I'm not even going to raise it, not even going to jump into it. I got another issue. I want to point out to you that the phrase, the husband of one wife, literally is translated, he must be a one woman kind of man. When Staubach said to Phyllis George, I enjoy sex and like sex as much as Joe does, the difference between us is that I have all my sex with one woman. What Staubach was saying to Phyllis George in front of millions of people was, I'm a one woman kind of man, you see. Now, whether or not you ever aspire to be in leadership in the church is irrelevant, quite frankly, in our discussion tonight. What is relevant is that if you are a husband, it should be your desire, and it should be your goal, and it should be an ambition of your life that in regard to your wife, you should desire to become and to be practicing and to be working towards being a one-woman kind of man. That is critical. A man who is a one-woman kind of man brings great stability to his family. A man who is a one-woman kind of man brings peace to his family. A man who is a one-woman kind of man brings provision to his family. He brings financial provision. He brings emotional provision. He sets an atmosphere of forgiveness. He sets an atmosphere of mercy. He sets an atmosphere of grace in the home because that's what's required. Because just as we are sinners, so our wives are sinners. No wife is without sin. No wife is without her flaws. We all have our strengths and we have our weaknesses. You know the strengths of your wife. You know the weaknesses. She knows yours. See, here's the deal. Here's the deal. When, when you really look at it, one of the fundamental assaults that has happened in this country that has had devastating results is that for generations and generations and generations and generations, even among those who were non-Christians, it was a virtue for a man to be a one-woman kind of man. But when the 60s hit and the sexual revolution, that was bulldozed and went out the window, and this idea that a man, I mean, that's outdated. What do you mean, thou shalt not commit adultery? What's that? That's just a man-made law. Actually, it's a God-given law. It's God-given. I got to make a call. Just kidding around. So I get a text this afternoon, just out of the blue. I have a friend who lives in another state. We talk or text maybe twice a year, maybe. Known this guy uh, since we were kids. Uh, basically lived in, in the same community, uh, knew his family, knew mine, okay. But we're, we just don't see each other much. So I get this text today at, uh, actually at 11.52 this morning. Steve, I thought I would fill you in on how things are going here. Now this guy is probably, I'm going to say 67, 68. Um, his older brother, um, Recently had a heart attack and just keeled over. Brother was probably 71, 72. Okay? Steve, I thought I would fill you in on how things are going here. And then he gives me four names, and I'm going to change the names. Robert, Steve, John, and Trent. 
These are the names of my brother's children, the brother who had the heart attack. None of them bear our family name because he never raised any of them. They have the names of the men who adopted them, raised them, or the name of their unwed mother. Here are some more names. Jennifer, I'm making these up. Rachel, uh, Cindy, Diane, Judith, Linda. These are the names of the women to whom my brother was married or fathered a child with, not to mention a mysterious woman who has surfaced from another state who claims to be his daughter. Now I want to tell you about this guy. Because I, I, I know this family. He was raised in a family that knew Christ and where the Bible was revered. Uh, I remember his grandfather. Uh, uh, an imposing, uh, an imposing big man, a uh, gracious man, but a man with authority who loved Christ and loved the Word of God. I can still remember his grandfather praying when I was a little boy. I remember that to this day. This man was steeped in a home where Christ was loved and honored and the Bible was revered. Even with all of this baggage, and maybe because of it, my brother knew, and, he, and I know the story, towards the end of his life, that God loved him and forgave him. I think because of his past, he better understood the redemptive reality of God that, and I'm putting in an editorial comment, that he really didn't get as a younger man. Okay? In his later life, he ministered to and related to broken people. I think Spurgeon said that if you would run from God, Satan would provide you with a fast horse. That's a great line. And that's what this brother did. In his youth, he ran from God. Oh, by the way, this all started occurring in the 60s. And now, the younger brother of the prodigal, me, is left to minister to the menagerie of what we call our family. All these names. It certainly is not boring, and it gives me hope for my own wayward children. Because this brother, the younger brother, who has walked with Christ all these years, his children... Uh, who were raised in the truth, they're all away from the Lord. About every six months, I'll get a text, pray for my daughter, pray for my... We've got guys in here that over the years have asked me to pray for their sons or their daughters. And their hearts were just broken and crushed. It's this guy. And you know what the Lord's done? He's brought a prodigal back. He's brought a prodigal back. He's brought a prodigal back. I, I just, I was struck by this. Do you see the devastation? Do you see the devastation? Here was a guy who was not a one woman kind of man. He bought the lie. Even though he was raised in the truth, he rejected it, and here his brother now is dealing with the ramifications and the consequences. And so what is it, the best thing, and I have not replied to this yet, but I am going to reply, and I'm actually going to make a call, and one of the things I'm going to say to him is, you know the best thing you can do, because this has got to be overwhelming. You know the best thing you can do? To be a God-fearing man who loves Christ. And you've been a one-woman kind of man for, what is it now, going on 45 years? Stay the course, man. Stay on your knees. Keep living the life. You can't do the work. You can't redeem these people. Only Christ can do that. 
but the pain and the anguish they've seen, they need to look at a man somewhere and say, that's how it's supposed to be done. Paul said, you follow me as I follow Christ. You see? In 1619, so you remember 1619, <laughs> or you read about it, Hernando Cortez brought 11 ships into the bay at Veracruz, was coming to conquer a new land, had no idea what was awaiting him. The men uh, got off the ships, started making the climb up the cliffs. And they didn't know what was going to face them. They had no idea if they were, I mean, they hoped for the best. They hoped for victory. They hoped they could have success and then perhaps go home. Um, as they got up to the very top of the cliffs, someone yelled and they looked back and all 11 ships were on fire. Now, how did all 11 ships get on fire? Well, the captain, Hernando Cortez, set them on fire. Fernando Cortez ordered that all the ships to be burned. Because now there was no option and there was no thought about going back. I think to be a one woman kind of man, one of the first things that must be done, you got to burn your ships. With where you are right now. Well, I've been married before and I'm divorced and this is my second, third marriage. That may be nothing you can do about that. You know Christ? Yes, I'm married now. Okay, burn your ships. You make this one work. That's all you can do. Is, is that not true? There's nothing you can do about the past. All you can do is burn the ships. Uh, it's the same concept that's in the Marine Corps. The model, how many Marines do we have in here? Okay, good. What is the motto of the United States Marine Corps? Semper Fidelis. What does Semper Fidelis mean? It means do your own thing. <laughs> In the Latin. That is not what Semper Fidelis means. Semper Fidelis means always what? Faithful. Not, all, not faithful when it's convenient. Not as faithful when your needs are being met. Not faithful when you're understood. Not faithful when you like how everything's going in your career and your family and everything's just, and your wife, and you were having great sex and all that. It's always faithful. Everybody else may be unfaithful, but I'm going to be faithful. You see? All this is tied in together. This is all character stuff. Is it not? Yeah, it is. So, let's talk about being a one-woman kind of man. Not saying it's easy. It's not easy. Anything worth doing isn't easy. This is hard. This is difficult. Uh, this, uh, this requires being a servant instead of being served. But Jesus talked about this. Uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus said to his men, if you're going to be great in the kingdom, you must become the servant of all. So there has to be a fundamental change in our hearts. There has to be a fundamental change in our perspectives because quite frankly, before we come to know Christ, it is all about us. We are the center of our lives. We are the center of our existence. I read some quotes to you in the last several weeks from Andreas Kostenberger's book, God, Family, and Marriage, and he does a great job of going back into the 60s and talking about the shifts and the changes. He's like a Spurgeon, make, a Spurgeon, a Spurgeon. He's like, a, well, Spurgeon did this too. He's like a surgeon making his cuts, precise cuts, with a scalpel, and, and he just shows what happened in the 60s that we went into a mindset not that God has given his word and God has given his law and we are to adhere to it, but we shifted to the individual being their own God and developing their own truth. And truth is what, whatever I want it to be and nothing trumps 
the libertarian idea of my own personal freedom. Not what God says, not what you say, not what the state says. I am supreme, I am sovereign. Now, you can't be a one-woman kind of man with that approach in life. You can't do it. You can be a male who sleeps with a lot of women and impregnates women, but you can't be a responsible man. I don't care how old you are. You see? Because that kind of life is flat out irresponsible. And how many of us sit here and names are flowing through our minds and those names are coming to our minds because with those names that represent people, we were irresponsible and took advantage of them. All of us have done that. All of us have hurt others by our own selfishness and irresponsibility. But Christ is the Savior who forgives and redeems and restores broken, self-centered men and, give them, and gives them new hearts and new minds and sets us free and gives us the power to now live in a different way than as how we used to live. And we have an opportunity to redeem the time and to build a new legacy. This is the gospel. Where else is there to have hope? Do you know how many people drown themselves in drink and in drugs because of guilt? Do you know how many people take their lives because of guilt? The greatest antidote to guilt, we're all guilty. The greatest antidote in the world is the blood of Christ. He expunged our guilt by his own blood. And when that grips you, what it does is it sets you free. Does it not? Yeah. Let me give you five ways to be a one-woman kind of man. This is very practical stuff, very down-to-earth. I deal with this stuff uh, uh, literally, and I try to apply this literally every day. I literally had to practice it yesterday afternoon. Literally. Um, when I think about being a one-woman kind of man, um, I'd break it down into five different areas. Number one, I am to be a one-woman kind of man with my eyes. With my eyes. Back in the 50s, there was a group called the Flamingos. They only had one hit, but it was a great song. And the song was, I Only Have Eyes for You. Uh, others have done that song over the years. Uh, Art Garfunkel did that song. Um, great song. But the Flamingos, the, the, the song, I Only Have Eyes for You, it, it went like, shabab, shabab. Ooh. Shabab, shabab. Let's stand and sing that together. <laughs> and then the song would go, how many of you guys know this song? Oh, yeah. All the old guys know this song. And here's what the guy, great words, the guy would say, are the stars out tonight? I can't tell if it's cloudy or bright, because I only have eyes for you. Shabab, shabab. <laughs> you can hear those guys, can't you? Shabab, shabab. Okay. And then the next verse, he says this. This is great. He goes, my love is a special kind of blind love. I can't see anyone else but you. Shabbat shalom. That's powerful. And I'll tell you what else that is. That's biblical. In Job 31.1, Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not gaze upon a young woman and lust. Now, isn't that something? Why would Job make a covenant with his eyes? Because he had the same heart issues that we have. Thousands of years ago, he dealt with the same. Men have always dealt with this stuff. Um, it's amazing what the eyes can do. 
And, and so much of the battle to be a one-woman kind of man has to do with the eyes, does it not? It was C.S. Lewis who said, if you look upon ham and eggs in lust, you've already committed breakfast in your heart. <laughs> I love that. The eyes. The eyes. My gosh. The eyes will do you in, man. Number one, the way women dress is, is absolutely remarkable. So many of them don't seem to get it. Um, Even in church, you'll see women with big Bibles who should use them to cover the low-cut cleavage that for some reason they think they need to be demonstrated. It always amazes me. Um, that's an eye issue for guys. Uh, we're particularly susceptible as men with our eyes because of how God has made us. Uh, there's a difference between men and women. I don't know if you guys have picked up on this. But why is it that guys are so... Well, let me back up. Uh, our culture says, our culture says, because we're far away from God, our culture says that men and women are equal. Well, the Bible says men and women are equal. But when our culture says men and women are equal, what they mean is they're the same. We're not the same. Male and female, he created them. Both made the image of God, but were different. And he made us different on purpose. Men and women are radically different. If you have a little boy and you have a little girl, you see the differences every day of your life. But our culture says, oh, no, they're the same. They are not the same. Men are particularly um, susceptible with the eyes. Um, are we not? Sure we are. It, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing how this happens. Um, you'll see a gal. And there's, and, and you can't help but see, I was, I was swimming yesterday afternoon at the club. And um, so as I'm walking in, I got my glasses. I take my glasses on. I can read, and I can't see. I can't read the numbers on my watch unless it's here. If it's there, I literally cannot read the numbers. That's how blind I am, which is an advantage at a health club. Because <laughs> I'm in the water, and I got goggles on, and everything's out of focus. But as I'm getting in the pool, there's a hot tub jacuzzi over here, and there are two girls, and... They don't have a lot on, but what they have is trying to contain quite a bit. <laughs> and I, okay, so I saw it, and I, okay, fine. Get in the pool, doing my laps. I get out, towel off, put on my glasses, and I'm walking, and they're still there. And there are now about four or five guys around. And they're probably, I'm gonna say, I see them 30 yards away, and I saw them, and they still had the same stuff on and the same, making the same attempts to hold everything in. And it was there, and uh, it was attractive. What do you do with that? I looked, and then, you know what? Here's what I had to do. Uh, I wanted to keep looking. I mean, I really did. Uh, but in order to be a one-woman kind of man, I needed to do something which doesn't come naturally. I needed to look away. See? Uh, see, this stuff is a battle, and it's a fight. Because the eyes can take you down. Can they not? And we deal with this every single day of our lives. I only have eyes for you. My love is a special kind of blind love. I can't see anyone else but you. So see, we got to be careful. You can't help seeing. You look, but you got to look away. Uh, when President Reagan was shot, and we've all seen the video of that event in D.C., how many times? Uh, you've seen it. You can see him coming out of that hotel. 
they were going to get him in the limo. You see the different people stationed. There was a Secret Service agent there. Suddenly shots ring out. What is the normal, natural human reaction when shots ring out? What do you do? You hit the deck. Everybody drops. And everybody dropped except for the Secret Service agent who was standing there. You've seen the film many, many times. He's standing there. And if you watch it again and again, he stands. He hears the shots. You see him fighting off his natural reaction. You see his eyes blink maybe five, six times. He's fighting off the natural tendency to go down. He fights it off, stays standing, and then because of his years of training, he fights off his natural tendency to go down, stays standing, and then his training continues to kick in, and he actually turns towards the shot, takes a shot. Now, that didn't happen overnight in his life, did it? That, that was a result of years and years of training, and that's how you become a one-woman kind of man with your eyes. So you see a gal at the club wearing something, and what do you want to do? You want to look, and you want to continue to look. But if you're going to be the man that God's called you to be, and you're going to follow Christ in that situation, you look away. Jesus talked about this. He talked about sexual temptation. If your eye offends you, he said, put on sunglasses. Do you remember that verse? <laughs> if your hand offends you, put it in a cast. That's not what he said. He was using hyperbole. He was making an extreme point. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. He didn't mean literally pluck it out, but he was trying to make a point. The point is this. Sometimes in, in situations of sexual temptation, extreme behavior is not only appropriate, it's necessary. So what do you do in that situation? So here I am, just swimming my laps, get out of the pool, here's the girl, I see, I wanna look, I, I wanna look, I wanna keep looking, but I had to kick in, you see. I had to kick in. That girl could have been my granddaughter. See what I'm saying? You gotta put this in perspective. There's a point you gotta grow up and be a man and not try to make them think you're a man or God, but in your heart of hearts, you want to follow Christ. This is a heart issue. So here's what I had to do. I looked, I saw her again, and then what did I have to do? I had to look away on purpose, and I did. I was walking like this. And then I'm about halfway to the door, and I had this pull. I wanted to... I did. I wanted to look again. So I had to kick in my next phase. And you know what I began to do? I began to pray for that girl. I did. I just began to pray for her. I said, Lord, I don't know if she knows you. I don't know who she is. I don't know anything about her. But I know this. She needs you in her life. And I would pray that you would work in such a way to bring her to know Christ. And, I, and I'm going to tell you something. You cannot pray for someone's salvation and lust at the same time. Now, that's what I got to do in order to help me in my own heart. I'm just telling you, I got to, I mean, I had to do it yesterday afternoon. This stuff never quits. Am I making sense here? See, when sexual temptation comes in, well, let me, let me at least get to number two. So we are, I'm to be a one woman kind of man with my eyes, okay? Here's number two. I'm to be a one woman kind of man with my eyes mind, with my mind. It was Oscar Wilde who said, uh, I can resist anything except temptation. Well, Oscar had a problem because that's the thing we got to resist. Uh, Franklin Jones said, what makes resisting temptation difficult for so many people is that they don't want to discourage it completely. Did you get that? What makes it what makes resisting temptation so difficult for many people is they don't want to discourage it completely. You have to want to discourage it completely. Probably the most uh, active sexual organ in the human body is the mind. Why is it, you, you see, <laughs> why is it that Jesus said, if you look upon a woman and lust, you've committed adultery. Because what we do in our mind, we just, the imagination starts taking off, and what do we do? We 
fantasize in the mind. We start conjuring up thoughts, and oh, that must be like this, and what would that be, and oh, and the mind just takes off. But you know, it's interesting when you read the scriptures, when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and it's in the context of wrong philosophies and wrong teachings, but one of the philosophies that is current in our day is that sexually you can do anything you want and it's, own, it's okay. But 2 Corinthians 10, verse, verses 3, 4, and 5, you'll find in there this nugget. We are taking, watch this, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So when these temptations, you can't stop from being tempted. But when the temptations come in, you have got to get aggressive. So many Christian men, when sexual temptation comes in, you know what happens? We're passive. Oh, there's nothing I can do. I just have to give in. We're like the, we become like, when, when the enemy comes after us and I'm te tempted sexually to sin in my mind, we're like the Pillsbury Doughboy. You remember that guy? Fluffy little guy? <laughs> just kind of ticklish and cute and gentle. See, you've got no backbone, Pillsbury Doughboy. And we just get bowled over. Oh, I'm tempted, I just, I just have to give in. You don't have to give in. You have to fight. You see, to be a one-woman kind of man with your mind, you have to fight and you have to get aggressive and you have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Forget Pillsbury Doughboy. you got to think Dick Butkus. Have you ever seen the NFL highlight reel on Butkus? You've seen it. Soldier Field, December, it's 28 degrees. He's got frozen snot coming down his face. He's got blood on his bandages. I mean, he's standing there between the guard and the center. He's going to blitz. I mean, Butkus was crazy. He was, not, he was insane. He was insane. Someone asked, once asked him if he'd ever hurt a player on purpose, if he'd ever really tried to injure a guy on purpose. He goes, no, no. I mean, I mean unless it was a playoff game. <laughs> he, he was honest. But you've seen Butkus. You've seen that picture. You've seen those, 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 those highlights. The guy was insane. He's there. He's standing there. He's doing this, the center, the guard, and it's a trap. So this guard pulls, and he's got a hole, and, and, and it's a trap. That's why they call it a trap. So the guard pulls. Butkus steps in. Now, he's done this long enough. He knows the other guard is pulling and going to blindside him. So he's, he's in there. He's ready to blitz. He steps in. Here comes that sucker. Pow! Right in the chumping gonads. And now there's a fullback. They used to have a player called a fullback. And the fullback would come, and now the fullback's going to crock him, but he's ready for him. It's this. It's this underneath the chin. And then he pivots, grabs that ball carrier by the helmet, gets the guy on the ground, knees him in the groin. That's what you call aggressive. And that's how you fight sexual temptation in your mind. You take... Every thought, boom. I don't know any other way to do it, do you? You got to take it captive. Because it'll beat you if you don't beat it. This is war. This is difficult. This is hard. Do we win every match? No. Sometimes I get put on my butt and I got to get back up and say, Lord, forgive me, and you're back in the game. I don't want that. I want you. You can't quit the fight. Okay. Number three. I'm to be a one-woman kind of man with my lips. With my lips. And when I, talk, when I say lips, I'm talking about your speech. Um, you need to be above reproach in your speech. I think you're not to be a flirt. If you're a one-woman kind of man, you're not flirtatious with other women. Oh, I don't mean anything by it. Well, then don't do it. Well, I'm just playing around. Well, why don't you play around in a way that doesn't diminish who you are in Christ and embarrass women and embarrass your wife? You've seen guys do this. This is not the standard that you want to put out the front of your wife or your kids or your grandkids. You want to put a higher standard. Am I making any sense? You raise the standard in your life with your lips and your behavior. Well, you know, I shouldn't tell this story. Well, then don't. It's like if I say that, I shouldn't tell this story, it's like it's okay now, go ahead and tell it. Well, if you shouldn't tell it, don't tell it. Zip it up. 
put a lid on it. Why would you tell a story like that? It's inappropriate. There should be no filthiness or coarse talk among you, the Scripture says. Not out of you. You're a man of God and your family. You're the family pastor. You're the patriarch. Act like it. Demonstrate it. Show those girls in your family what a godly man is like. Don't have your speech in the gutter or near it. Right? Right. And they will respect you and love you for it. Here's number four. Be a one-woman kind of man with your hands. With your hands. What I mean by this is be careful how you touch other women. When I was in seminary, I went to a church, and there was a deacon, and he was a greeter. And the thing about this guy, any time a good-looking woman came in, he became anointed. Not with the spirit of God, but with a spirit of lust. And he would, I watched him embarrass women, hug them, quite frankly, maul them. Now, no one ever said a word to him because he was a very wealthy man and the biggest giver in the church. Nobody would dare say a word to this guy. I remember seeing his embarrassed wife every time this would happen. He would embarrass women. The guy was just an embarrassment. Had no business being on the church board. He didn't have the character for it. I wasn't surprised when a couple years later he ran off with the youth pastor's wife. He was probably 60. She was 23. He never was a one-woman kind of man. Be careful how you touch women that you're not married to. There's an appropriate, legitimate way. There's a way that's not appropriate, and you know your heart. We'll leave it there. Okay? Set the standard. Number five, I'm going to be a one-woman kind of man with my feet. With my feet. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee immorality. If you see immorality, you don't hang around and check it out for its deeper artistic meaning. I wonder what that means. It's, you know what it means. It's filth. Doesn't matter what the critics say. It's filth. You're a man of God. Be ye holy as I am holy. You don't hang around that. You don't put that in your mind. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's what you used to do. You don't do it anymore. There are all kinds of situations come up where we need to flee. You just, if you remember nothing else, just remember flee. Just flee immorality. That's all you need to remember. If it's wrong, if it's immoral, flee. Just get out of it. I remember a young guy telling me that he was on a business trip. He was the young guy. He was the new guy. He was the youngest guy. They're on this trip. They decided to go to have dinner. This guy that's hosting them. Oh, I have this favorite restaurant. They all pile in his car. They, it's a high-class gentleman's club. It's a strip joint. They're walking in. He's the youngest guy. Everyone else is his senior. And they're walking in, and he's convicted. He's been married a couple years. And he said to his boss, he said, Hey, you know, I think I'm just going to go back to the hotel. Oh, no, no, you need to come in. It's really important. We've got some stuff to discuss. He goes, yeah, I, no, I just, I just think I'm going to go back. I, 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 and, and his boss just kept pushing him. He said, you know, I'm not going in there. I can't do that and be faithful to my wife. Now, that took some guts. That took a lot of guts. You say, well, you know, you could have fired him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you something. They fire you over that? Let me tell you something, man. The Lord Jesus will get you a job. Because you're his guy. He sees that. He sees that. I'll tell you what, his wife loved him for it. We find ourselves in different situations, and we're not quite sure to do. Uh, you flee. Sometimes to flee immorality, you might have to uh, get on a bus. Gus. That might happen. I don't know. Uh, to flee, if there's a bus, get on. Uh, to flee immorality in another situation, you might have to uh, make a new plan. Uh, stand. Because that plan is immoral, so you need to make a new plan. Uh, in another situation, it might require you... Uh, 
flee to even drop off the key. Flee. Um, that's a song from Simon Garfield that Uncle did called 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. If you turn it around, it's 50 Ways to Be a One Woman Kind of Man. You just flee him around. It's a higher standard. It's what he's called us to. You know, guys, for some of us, this is new. Well, let me tell you something. You say, man, Steve, I don't know if I can aspire to this. Hey, you don't have to get it all wired tonight, and you can only do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you what, you take, you take a right step in the right direction. That's how it begins. And you say, Jesus, I want to be this kind of man. Would you help? Would you help me, Lord, in my battle with pornography? We have guys in here who for years were enslaved to pornography. I mean slaves. Pornography owned them. And they've been set free by Christ. But they had to be honest and they had to be, they had to be truthful and they had to admit their sin to a brother that they could trust, who held it in confidence, and then there was an accountability because you can't break that sin by yourself. You just can't do it. You're not strong enough. The two are stronger than one. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2, and thus fulfill the law of Christ. But you have to want it, and you have to desire it. But I'm going to tell you something. The assistance of Almighty God and the angels of God and the power of the Holy Spirit is at the disposal of the man who wants the change. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro about the earth, looking for those whose hearts are fully his, that he may strongly support them. Our Father, we come to you. We've all failed. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Help us now to walk in righteousness. Help us to take the right steps. Help us to say no to what we should say no to and yes to what we should obey. It's a journey. We won't walk it with perfection, but we don't have to because we're covered by your blood, but we want to. Help us. Strengthen us. To the guy in here who needs to be honest and come clean with another brother, give him the courage. He won't be rejected. He'll be received and loved and encouraged and supported. That's what you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.